going. All right, so I'll go live. Going live. And we're live. Uh, hello, everybody. We're here for a watch along uh, together with uh, Jacopo. Who's, where are you, Jacopo, today? I mean, Torino, Northern Italy. In Torino, Northern Italy, the beautiful city of Torino. A uh, city that I miss because uh, of Corona. I haven't been able to visit for the past two years. But uh, yeah, something... I, I, mention, I mentioned our ski session uh, in the last two workshops with other attendants because, uh, I mean, that it was a good time. We should repeat it next year. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So we're, we're about to go live. So let me play the... Um, a clip. Uh, I haven't been uh, promoting this clip very much before, but I, I did want to play that because I, I think it's a, a great way to illustrate uh, how we think about change uh, at Oikosofi and also uh, the ethos that we have when we organize these conferences, the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, and of course, also when we do consulting. So I'm interested to show this to Jacopo for the first time and hear his comments. So here we go. Today the dream has been realized. We are on the moon. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. So, Jacopo, what, what thoughts came to your mind as you were watching this uh, clip? Wow, it's, it's uh, triggering a lot. And, I mean, a little bit of anxiety, actually. <laughs> I mean, oh, uh, luckily, I'm in a different position. <laughs> I, I really enjoy my, my job. So that's why I'm trying to help. <laughs> oh, we are in the same crusade as Oikosophy. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I think that, so this is, um, a, it's a storytelling uh, video about what we do, of course, and uh, it was, the, the video was made in cooperation with a friend of mine who's a movie maker. Uh, he does a lot of commercial work, but also full length, uh, full feature movies, uh, Christian Wenger here in Finland. And uh, uh, I, I think the, that, uh, so we had a lot of discussions with Christian about what we want to convey with the message. And uh, what ended up happening was that we quickly figured out that a lot of the things that happen, happen because we want them to happen. And uh, he, he used, I think, a beautiful metaphor, which is children, right? Like children make things happen. When you look at it from the outside, you as an adult, you go like, oh, that's not really nice. And, you know, they're missing so much stuff. But as you are a child, as you are experimenting and, and learning and exploring, you don't care you are making things happen and then the contrast is with when we become adults and go you know to the to the world of work and all of the things that we try to do 
And I think that this, this dichotomy, this contrast between wanting and trying is really important because a lot of the stuff that we end up trying to do, and I think trying is a, is a great word because we do it sometimes even half-hearted because we were told we had to or we're not really sure why we should. Like it's, it's not the wanting, it's the trying. Like we're trying to empower. There's a great uh, clip where, where there's this guy trying to empower and shouting at his colleagues, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, it, all, it, it brings us back to the, to the cost of trying. So basically when you're a child, it, it's easy to experiment. And then when you start working, it becomes very hard to experiment while experimenting is the key point of learning and trying. So... It is a powerful message. Absolutely. And uh, talking about learning and talking about real life, we have a keynote for you today, which we will be watching and commenting live. Uh, so, Jacopo, we haven't yet agreed on how to do this, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, we will be showing the uh, keynote on the screen. And uh, you guys will hear the keynote as, as, uh, at the same time as we do. Uh, by the way, so if you want to get into the chat and start chatting along, uh, giving your question, giving us your questions, comments, uh, and observations, then please go ahead. Uh, so, Jacobo, how how do we interrupt the keynote when you want to make a comment? Like, what what's what's our signal? Uh, like this. <laughs> like, All right. Hey, like, hey, hey. <laughs> yeah. So we'll we'll use both audio and uh, video feedback in that case. All right. Very good. So. Um, I'm ready to go. Are you ready, Yagopo? I am. I am. I am. All right. Let's do this, guys. Vasco? Yeah, yeah, let me just pause this for a second. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, actually, I cannot hear the keynote. So there is a, this is, this is live, but actually this is the, the All best right. part of the shows. <laughs> cool. cool. All right. So let me see. Let me just double check that we can hear it on the stream live. Yeah. Uh, because that would be uh, too bad if that's not the case. At least the last time I did this, it worked fine. So just give me a second. Yep. Just checking this on the live stream. In the meantime, I can play uh, like an elevator music. <laughs> All right, it, it does not seem to be working. 
so let me try, try something else. Funny because we did have this uh, working just fine last time we did this. So let's do this. <laughs> All right, it, it does not seem to be working. So let me just try something else. All right, so let's go. This is now something that we need to debug live. So you're watching the yeah. live uh, debugging as it happens so let's... in the meantime we can engage the audience but just by asking them to reflect on yeah go ahead you do that you yeah. do that you go yeah. ahead and you entertain us yeah i mean so um dear audience a uh, dear attendant uh you might start reflecting what's the difference between value and what is not value and before we listen to chris williams words we might reflect individually without sharing our ideas so far but for the moment um what's the difference between how do we define value when we are developing a software or a digital product or a product or a service in general and whether whether the value is in what you get out of what you do or is in, in what you do this is a i mean it, it it sounds like just philosophy but actually it's the I think this is the core root cause of many problems that we find in software development. Uh, I, I don't know where Chris Williams will go with his keynote, but I'm hoping that he will give, he will give us good insights on, on how to, to untangle this problem. And uh, we will see. In the meantime, we wait for Vasco to be out of the oh, uh, uh, Jacopo, let's try this, all right? So I'm going to share a Chrome tab. And hopefully, you will be able to hear it as it plays. So you just let me know. All right, you can hear it. Yes. Well, welcome. Agilist Scrum Masters. Great. Well, we'll, we'll just get started with the, the watch world. along uh, then. I'm here um, today with our uh, keynote. So, once again, speaker, we're watching the keynote Chris with Williams. Chris Williams. Hey, Chris. Welcome hey, Vasco, to the how summit. Start. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be part of this summit, by the way. So, thank you. I've been looking forward to this. Absolutely. And the topic we have for our viewers today is also very exciting for me uh, value backlogs, not story backlogs. Um, besides being the host of the Badass Agile podcast, Chris is also, of course, a very experienced Agile coach and uh, a person that has done a lot of other community-centric activities. Now, before we dive into the conversation, it's going to be a very important conversation. I, I do want to highlight that there are also other sessions here on the summit that touch on Agile as a business advantage, as a strategic business advantage. For example, Joshua Kerievsky uh, will be talking about his latest book, Joy of Agility, where he collects many, many different stories of how Agile has impacted businesses in a positive way. But there's more. Uh, there's, a, there's also Jerry Starzia, and uh, uh, there's also uh, uh, Jerry Starzia, by the way, an entrepreneur himself. And uh, there's also a survey of Agile coaches where RJ Hynek and uh, Lee Griffin talk about how important the business understanding is for the Agile coach profession. So check those out at scrummastersummit.org. But now we focus on value, uh, which is the core topic of today. So uh, Chris, let's start by introducing what you mean uh, to our audience. So what do you mean by value backlogs and why are they so important? Sure, thank you for that. You know, you mentioned entrepreneurship. I'm an entrepreneur as well. So I live and die by the value that I'm able to bring to my audience and my potential customers. So I believe I get it. And I get it because I failed so many times and had to learn through experimentation. But the minute we get into large scale software development teams, we become disconnected from the value that we bring to the organization or to its end users. So my proposal is that we experiment with that we investigate and try and put in our toolbox, which I know is a big word for you, Vasco. Don't, don't take my way as the way, capital T, capital W. A great coach We're back to knows experiment. that there is no way. 
What What do you mean, Jacob? We're back to the to the point that we, we started from in the introduction. So basically, we're we we are back to the the concept of experimenting and trying, and not to not to rely on pre-made recipes. I mean, this is a key point of the whole agile thing. It starts from there, and I think it makes a good point. And also, you made a good point when you said that. I mean, the business awareness of agile coaches is one of the most scarce resources in the agile world. Actually, if there is one problem that we have to fix within the agile community, and it's not actually not just in the recent years, but since the very beginning, is the lack of business awareness, not knowledge. It's just, it basically, it's, you have to be aware that there is a problem which is related to business, and the business is the key point of the whole agile thing. And I mean, I like to say that all the thing, all the all the discussion about how we feel while we're working is necessary, but not sufficient for a su successful business. And so that 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 is a, a, a key point. So let's see where where it goes. Yeah, I, I would add to that that one of the questions that I would like us all to have in the background of our minds is what is value, because it's yeah. not always that clear. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's the question we opened up with with the, with the audience while you were yeah, fixing the audience. Exactly. So what, basically, do do we find value in what we do just because we do it? I mean, being tired at the end of the day doesn't necessarily imply value. So that's that's the, my keep my that's to keep it to keep it brief. It can be resumed like this. Yeah, we we should definitely come back to that. What is value question during this keynote? So let's let's hear. Yeah, but I propose to you that if we were to look at the work that we do as a backlog of value delivery rather than feature delivery, I think we could unlock the potential and the original intention of agility, which is to say that it's only when we treat the work that we do as value that we deliver that we can start to say, this work isn't so important and therefore we won't do it because it doesn't matter to the customer, to the client. Yeah. Think of um, an auto mechanic. If you bring your car into a mechanic and your mechanic discovers that your tires are bald and they come to you and they say, what would you like to do here? It's going to be $2,300 for a set of new tires and rims. When we look at the value that the customer has in mind, so first and foremost, as a customer, I'm interested in the safety of my family. I want to make sure that I don't do anything or neglect to do anything that will put my family in danger. But next, I like some style and rims. Let's imagine, right? And I like them funky brake calipers while you're in there, you know, those real sporty ones. I got a lot of values in there, but I don't have unlimited budget. Right. And I don't want to pay a five or ten thousand dollar bill just for a set of tires. Twenty three hundred bucks was enough of a sticker shock. So what do we do? If as an agilist, we can ask our customer, well, what do you value most? What's the thing you most want to get out of this investment in your money? And tell me if you have multiple priorities, which one's most important? So here I would say, well, the safety is the most important thing. Looking great is the next one. And then it goes down the chain. Uh, I could probably save a couple of bucks on insurance by having some new tires, blah, blah, blah. But we're really going down the list of priority values. Now my Please, mechanic who cares knows about safety? that they can offer an alternative solution. If I All right. So you have to explain that further. No, I mean, I was joking. I was, about, I was saying that speed, who cares about safety? But I mean, obviously, I, I don't think it's true. <laughs> uh, but this, I think, uh, I, this is definitely not a, a, a metaphor that I have used very much, but... Uh, I think it helps to understand that actually value isn't one thing and it isn't one thing to all the people. It's it's not even one thing to one person. It's definitely yeah. not one thing to everyone, yeah. right? Like like you just talked about it's, speed. It's, it's, or... it's definitely context sensitive. So even uh, when, when, when we talk about user, user personas with my, with my customers, actually, I insist, I stress a lot the point that a given user persona, it only exists in a context and there is no uh, parents. There are parents who are trying to collect their children at, the, at school and there are parents who are trying to have a, a, a five a, a football play game a Thursday night and they have to put their children somewhere <laughs> in the meantime. So basically these are two very two different scenarios in which you are a parent 
but actually your needs are changing a lot. So and yeah, that, that's actually a good point because I would take that and expand that to mean that actually the use of personas is a very limited understanding of the motivations for people to take value out of whatever you're producing. Uh, I yeah. myself have been using the concept of avatar, which we define just to make sure we don't use the word persona. And yeah. avatar for us means the collection of uh, feelings, experiences that trigger certain yeah. needs. Not, not, also... not, not the age or, you know, are, are they uh, girls or boys or men or women, but rather that what, what are the, the triggers? What are the things that make them want to do certain things or achieve certain things? It's also worth mentioning Simone Cicero's Platform Design Toolkit which insists a lot on the transaction between pairs of uh, roles of entities. So actually, if you want to, if you focus on the needs of one of one user persona, actually you are missing the, the the entities that that persona can exchange value with. And usually that is what is happening. So basically you do something because you are creating something for someone else and then you get a counter value back. That's what... So, uh... Was it uh, Kathy Sierra who talked about make your users awesome? I think it was something like that. Yeah. So it's not it's not about making your uh, well let, let's say let your uh, uh, what would be a, a, a good example. It, it, it's not it's not about making your product owner learn how to use a whatever electronic tool to communicate with the team. It's about making your product owner look like a great product owner to the development team. Exactly, exactly. Or if you're baking, if you're baking bread, basically it's not your need, and then you have baked bread. But it has to be easy to sell bread and to get money in in, in return. In so return. The transaction has to be facilitated. That's where value lies in. Yeah, you should write that in the chat. By the way, do you have the YouTube link? Uh, yes, I will. I will find the YouTube link and then I will write this in the All chat. All right. So we'll we'll play the keynote. If I balk at the 2300 bucks, which doesn't this happen all the time? Don't we see questions in the industry? What, what do I do? What do I tell my product owner? If there's something that was supposed to go in Sprint X, the current Sprint, but it's too big. So let's dive into that a little bit more because, uh, sure. of course, the example is illustrative. Uh, uh, but we need to translate it into mm -hmm. the reality of software development. You, you talked about something there that I think we need to break down and, and perhaps even offer a tool for for our yes. uh, viewers toolbox uh, in okay. that regard, which is okay. So I'm, I'm talking to a product owner and he does say that he wants this checkbox on this page. And, and this mm -hmm. is a real situation. I've seen this happen uh, uh, in pretty large companies. Things, you know, requirements can come up with uh, as as this, right? I want the checkbox on this page. And of course, a checkbox can be added to the page, but what does that mean? Like, why is that important for you? So when you work with your clients today, what are the techniques, the questions, the approaches you use to uncover what value is? It's a great question. And it, it highlights that the tool is better questions. And there are three that I want you to try. The first question is, what do you want? Specifically, what outcome do you want? And inherent in that question is, who do you want this for? Who would this serve? And why do you care? Yes. So when you say, I want a new checkbox, you say, great. What outcome will that checkbox get? For whom will it deliver it? And why does that matter to you? The second question that you can ask is, what does done and done well look like then? And then the third question I want you to keep in your back pocket, which is, what else might work? And I'll explain that one in just a moment. So let's run through those. Wait, the first, wait, 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 the first question is basically wait, wait, saying, wait, 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 wait. whom are we here to serve? <laughs> and what outcome Go is valuable? I, I mean, the three questions are in disorder for a reason. Uh, and I mean, it makes sense, but I love them in reverse order. So basically the third question is the one that triggers me the most. So basically, whenever you reflect on the options that you have to fix a problem, that's when you are triggering the right value-driven approach. So basically, you're caring more about the problem rather than one given solution that it might be appealing to you, it might be convenient to you, it might be uh, easy for you and whatever. So the third question, the, the very moment you start questioning 
the many ways you can solve the problem, actually that shows that you are really caring about solving the problem. And this is powerful, very powerful. Although right. I understand that the order in which he put the questions is obviously making more sense when we are, uh, I mean, there, there is no point in asking what, how many options do we have if we don't, if we don't ask ourselves what is the problem. So we have a question from the audience. Uh, Margaret asks, can you talk about KPIs, please? And uh, I, I asked her if she had a more specific question in mind. But I, I, uh, at least the, the question triggers this thought in my mind, is that value is very often not part of the KPIs that teams are using uh, and even companies are using to manage their, their delivery and even their business. So, for example, a lot of companies have KPIs on revenue and revenue is not a value metric. Uh, it is yeah. a metric that tells you, it gives you an insight as to how much value you're producing, but it doesn't tell you, you know, what is that value? Is it getting delivered at the right rate with the right level or whatever that is? So we need a different set of metrics in order to get to that revenue later on, which is a lagging indicator, right? It's like a rear view mirror when it comes yeah. to company and team performance. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Jakob? Well, um, revenues are, I mean, uh, if we, okay, we, 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 I start from the particular and then I go abstract, but um, revenues are just a proxy of value. And if it's not value in itself, just, and it shows by the fact that there are companies that have been crashing and going bankrupt the year after having had a, a revenue burst. So basically that if, if it were, if it were value, no company could be burst after having had a um, could could go bankrupt after having a, having had a, a burst of revenues. Um, in general, uh, it's very hard to to track value most of the time because most of the time we are creating intangible value. Uh, on the other hand, I would love to quote uh, Jonathan Stark. Uh, Jonathan Stark says uh, recently, said recently in a, in, a, in a newsletter of his that actually if you have uh, an intangible value, still someone is perceiving that value and if that perception is subjective, it's not a problem to measure the value you're creating for that subject. So basically you can ask the subject that get that value to express a rating, to express a vet, uh, uh, um, an, uh, uh, an evaluation. So basically, the problem and they is, do actually, right? Like yeah, everybody actually, does that. Even everybody if does that. Every time we buy a house, we are actually aggregating tons of intangible metrics and KPIs for things that are worth hundreds of thousands of, or even millions of euros, and then. We are not just questioning, yeah, well, we don't have a, an objective KPI to spend all this money. All of a sudden, in companies and organization, managers start asking for objective, clear, crisp metrics just because, you know what, just because they are, they are embodying a bureaucracy. And bureaucracy, in the definition of Nassim Taleb, is a device to remove responsibility from those who make decisions. And that is the point. So once the KPI has been, okay, so the KPI told that it's right, so it's not my fault if I made the wrong decision. And that's yeah. why you can have high revenues and, and give a bonus to a manager, and then the year, the following year, having the organization completely bankrupt, exactly yeah. because the responsibility for that company and organization has been completely separated from the manager that made the decisions that... That so that, for yeah. those of you who read Italian, uh, Jacopo is still writing the English version, but here's the Italian version of Extreme Contracts. There's a lot of stories here about how uh, they, uh, I mean, him, Jacopo, and his band explored value in many different ways. Value for themselves, value for the, uh, for the venue owners, value for the audience. So definitely uh, a lot of great examples. Uh, one if thing you that know, you made uh, you know, on my website, there is a free chapter on optionality and you can subscribe to the newsletter to be informed when the rest of the book will come yeah. out. Yeah. Can you put the link on the, on the YouTube sure. uh, chat, by the way, yes. the, the, uh, the thing though, that we've started and uh, the keynote hopefully will get us there. But the thing, the thing that we've started is this 
I think this connect and the need in our community to start talking about this connect between the KPIs and the value, what we can measure and what matters, right? And, and it, I'm not saying that what matters is not measurable. There are many ways to go about that. But what we end up measuring and what matters for our customers and for our business are very often not co- uh, not linked, right? Like this disconnect. So let, let's listen a little bit more and see how um, Chris guides us in that reflection. Yeah. To them. Let's get super clear on that because so often teams don't know the answer to that question. Product owner says, I want this and I want this first. Great. So we start working on it. And if we use the traditional story design, you may, have you ever seen this before? The, as a blank, I want to blank. So I can blank. How often are the, I want to, and so I can the same thing as an Instagram user. I want to be able to upload videos so I can upload videos. To me, that's sloppy work. And that's I mean, even when they, when they write the, the, the whole stop, template, because sometimes stop, stop, they, stop. they just write, I want. That's right. That's right. And it's the. So. This is a key point. The, 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 the Global Scrum Master Summit is a perfect chance to make this clear once for all. So basically, the ternary structure of user stories can be a, an obstacle to quality and to value definition. If every time we get into the trap of orthodoxy, we are actually honoring a cargo cult. We are honoring a procedure rather than honoring the value of something. So. Even Patton in the in the very good book User Story Mapping frees all of us from the ternary structure. It just says whatever conveys the value that we're trying to deliver the final user with the releasing of that of that user story is fine. And so we 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 get this like hey. I got. I, I I think we can call it the compliance monster. So basically, whenever you you start as conceiving that writing a user story in ternary structure is enough to have described value, which is I mean I'm sorry, it's harder than that. It's not enough. So what? So can you tell us a little bit more what you mean by that? What What is the format you're talking about, and how do you use yeah. it? The format that we are talking about is the one mentioned by Chris Williams, the one in which user stories are written with three statements as a given user. I want a given interaction so that I can get some business value. And Chris Williams has just said that usually, usually that this structure is abused by saying as a user, I want to click on uh, the product link so that I can click on the product link. I mean, I've seen this so many times. And actually, this is so, it's so amazing. Not, I mean, I don't want to be pedantic. I don't, I'm not just blaming uh, those people who are abusing of, uh, of, uh, of the structure because I did it many times in the beginning. Where, where, I mean, it was uh, now it's almost 20 years ago. But the point is that what it strikes me most is that people are accepting to do something so dumb in order to honor a structure, a procedure, a recipe, rather than questioning, hey, well, so let's get back to the big picture. What are we trying to describe here? Or, or the small picture. So the, here's the thing. We've, we've touched on this a couple of times. So like, how do we describe value, right? Like, so we, it, it's okay to say, okay, the, the, the story format is being abused, which is fine. It, every format, er, any template will always be abused by someone. Yes. But yes. Th- so, so now we need to, to take it further. So, okay, so what, what are the alternatives? What are the things that you've experimented with that have helped you work with the teams to crystallize value? Sorry, I didn't get the question. What 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 have you done? What in your experience? What what are the things that work to help the teams and the product owners crystallize value instead of writing the story template? Yeah, the three questions that Chris Williams uh, gave us in the beginning are actually I think they're they're uh, they're very close to what I do. And the point is, uh, I I'm I'm actually trying to uh, answer the reason why we should ever need this stuff on, in in place. So the why. So why do we need a click? Uh, why do we need to tag people in our tweet? 
that's because I want to call, I want to relate with someone else. I want to bring people in, for example. I want to bring people on my, I want to, I tag Vasco on my tweet because I want Vasco to read my tweet so that once in a while it might retweet one of them. So basically, this is, this is the reason why. And so asking why, it's much better than, than what. And, and I can definitely, I, in the beginning, 20 years ago, in 2005, 2004, 2003, I was insisting so much on the ternary structure of these stories. And now I don't care about that anymore. I mean, as long as in it's fact, that even one phrase is enough. Like we don't need anything more than one. Even phrase. just one name. So it's like a, a, a post-it with us. Uh, uh, let's imagine we are talking about the uh, Twitter tags. It's just tagging, tagging. We, we all know what it is. So, and as long as we and, are... And, but, okay, so do, you just talked about something that is not obvious. We all know what it is. It's not something that is obvious in many no. teams. And, no, exactly. and Chris mentioned that, right? Like when, when teams get disconnected from what we are actually trying to do. And yes. uh, when I talk about coaching product owners, I very often talk about uh, the fact that we don't need a backlog. Actually, it's okay if we just have a vision an impact map and then an overview of the product with a story map and that's it like those three documents are enough because yeah, the rest we know what it is or if we don't then the fact that we have a detailed backlog hides the fact that we don't know the rest i love to mention i love to quote my friend giorgio sironi he always says our whip limit is one and our backlog length is one <laughs> It's just the next thing, next thing, next thing. But of course, but then you need the context that uh, creates the understanding of value. And I think that tools like vision and impact map are great to create that context of value, right? Like the impact map gives us, uh, uh, I think, a very useful approach to detail yeah. what are the different perspectives on value and Absolutely. who we are serving with each of the things we do. Like we, yeah. we don't need to serve all the users or all the, the stakeholders at the same time. We can serve them separately one by one, but we need to know which ones we are serving. Absolutely. And you can then bring those impacts as the reason why for any release that you plan in user story mapping. So basically these are, we are giving our audience uh, basically a two-step uh, recipe <laughs> to follow. So basically you start thinking on the impacts and then when you have selected the right impacts that you want to have and the right action, the right uh, output that could lead to that outcome, actually you can take those output and make them the subject of user story map slices. So basically so that you can release incremental slices of value in in that are I mean that are end to end that I remember your critic about the uh, the metaphor of the elephant carpaccio because actually you want to deliver vertical slices of value and user study mapping insists a lot on the fact that you should deliver end to end value that still makes sense to the user and that making sense is we can drive it back to the impact mapping so. That's yeah, a, exactly. And so my suggestion is instead of doing elephant carpaccio, you should do a million microscopic elephants Ex one at exactly. a time. I love this one. The, the army of micro elephants. <laughs> exactly. All right. Let's go back. Let's go back. So I can that we're talking about when we talk about value backlogs is why will this benefit you? What will this do for you? And that could be based around a core metric like this helps this helps the organization retain customers. This helps the organization reduce customer churn. This helps the organization reduce employee churn. This helps my customers save time. This helps my customers feel happy. What are the reasons why we're building this feature and why does it matter? Did that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, now we've all been there, right? Like we, we try to have that conversation going but uh, we get this very high level answers like, you know, revenue, uh, cost of acquisition. Uh, and, and that's assuming that they are this clear because very often that they are not even this clear. Right. But for, for an average team, 
uh, revenue is a um, a bridge too far, right? Like it's something that is so far away from their day to day that if you go to them and say, "Hey, we, we're we're doing this because we want to increase our revenue," they they probably don't have enough business model understanding to even understand what are the triggers and and the levers that that increase revenue generation, and therefore they can't translate it to their reality of working on a particular part of the product or or even a product or an app, whatever that might be. So of course we need to break that down, right? Like, so how do you help the teams and the customers you work with break that down so that it's not that high level that feels, you know, unreachable? Absolutely, great question. And this somebody who who's much smarter than me invented something called the empty chair technique. I'm sure you heard of it, where we put a chair in the middle of the room to represent the customer who isn't there, who can't speak. But I prefer to draw a picture on the board or put up a name like Stan or Julie, and say Julie's our customer. And how are we serving them? What are some of the reasons why we're building everything that we're building? What's their day like? What do they worry about? What do they care about? If I build this software well, if I deliver an amazing product for them, what changes in their life? What do they? And and by the way, the most important question asked when talking about value is not in terms of digits. It's always in terms of a feeling. What's Julie going to feel? If I deliver this software and it takes all of her bookkeeping out of her hands, she doesn't have to worry about it. It's all automated. She doesn't have to think about it anymore. How would she feel? How would she feel if she could use that time to spend more time with her family or to work on her passions? Is that important? And so asking those questions in either an initial discovery or as part of every single sprint of the product owner, and if they're not thinking that way, they need to. I got this is really important because these. at the end of the day, if you're disconnected from the outcome so for it. um i love and i strongly support the 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 personification of users persona i mean the the fact that i mean i have a i make a very strong case against the average user so uh when i work with uh, corporates there are usually very strong skills in quantitative analysis of the market which usually even they struggle a lot to, 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 to understand the, the clusters of needs that might suggest personas, and, and I think they, are, they, can, they can be useful, still, they miss one thing. They insist a lot on quantitative analysis. They insist a lot on the statistical meaning, uh, they, uh, the fact that this data have to be statistically meaningful. But I always reply with this. And I, uh, it was a conversation that I had last week with one of them in the research and development department of a given uh, corporation. And I asked them, okay, how many instances of your father do you have? How many instances of your mother do you have? One. Okay, do you think user. this is a, a, I mean, is this a statistical, statistically meaningful number of occurrences of your mother and your father or not? Not, absolutely. But do you know well them? How well do you know it? I mean, you know, if it, 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 it cannot be your mother, your father can be one of friend of yours, your brothers, your siblings, I mean, whatever. So the point is that knowing a person deeply and knowing a person in their needs is possible. And that's something that we do again every day without the need for KPIs and without the need for statistically meaningful data. So my point here is the same. We have to know our users one i'm not saying one by one but personas persona per persona so that we know so we have to talk about uh, with our users we have to understand how our the vision of our idea or the vision of our service or product can be put in the in the folds in the tight recesses of their daily life and so you want to know how they behave and no number can express this no, and, and this i think this uh brings another topic in the understanding of value which is this uh when we look at the users that we are serving we need to understand them as as whole beings right absolutely we, and very often the whole concept of persona is about understanding them as single users like we understand people only as the user of our tax uh, software. No, that's not who they are. 
they, they're not even trying to get their taxes handled. They're just trying to reduce the, the burden of day-to-day -day life or, or they're trying to reduce the taxes they pay or, yeah. or they're trying to, to uh, uh, you know, delegate the handling of taxes to somebody else who uses that software, like whatever that is. Yeah, we're back to the context-oriented definition of personas' needs and uh, interactions with their immediate surroundings. And in fact, this also tells us that there's never only one user no, that we serve. Exactly. There is there's the a myriad of users. And, yeah. and if we use persona as the concept, we get lost because the persona is then needs to be so detailed as to be meaningless, right? It's the, the concept of the average user. You don't have an average user. You have many different users. Now, yeah. some are more important than others because of your business model or whatever, but you don't have one user that is the average of the characteristics of all the users. That doesn't exist. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, that, uh, to make it clearer for the audience, basically, if you have a population made of people who are starving and not eating one chicken, not even every, any day, and having someone else who's, who's eating three chickens each lunch, actually, the users that eat a proper amount of one chicken and a half every day actually doesn't exist. And so you cannot build an app for people who eat on a regular basis. So that's that's. That's the key point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And this highlights how important it is to have a different concept than persona to define value because the values will be different for these different needs, right? And also, one other thing is that is, is, is the second point uh, of his is the one about feelings as value. And it's amazing how hard it is to remind my customers that most of the commerce and most of the economy relies on social and personal needs and not objective needs. The, the, the most flourishing economies are based on things that are beautiful, things that make your status, things that make you feel good, safe, happy, beautiful, and blah, 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 blah. So it's amazing how all of a sudden when we are in the rooms of the corporations trying to build new products, Engineers and, eco and economists start only thinking about what is necessary, what is what is what is needed to 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 make to realize to to complete complete transactions. I mean, which I, I mean, to me, it's wrong. All right, let's continue. Yeah. If you're disconnected from the victory, you're gonna have a harder time motivating your team, and most importantly, what happens? Because people always ask you this, right? What happens? My product owner's on vacation. They didn't tell me they were going on vacation. I got a question. How are we going to get through this sprint if I don't get an answer to my question? Well, if your product owner isn't there, but Julie is or Stan is, you can take a shot. And that to me is what Agile is all about. If the product owner is not in the room and I have to make a gamble, make a gamble based on what I know my customers want to feel. I, 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 like that, I like that uh, term of being in the room, uh, whether it is a, a cutout or, or a, a printed definition of, of the, the customer or whatever that is. Yeah. I, I recall uh, when I started reading about uh, XP Extreme Programming way back when, and they had this practice called customer in the room. <laughs> It wasn't product owner in the room or analyst in the room or <laughs> proxy for the product owner in the room. It was customer in the room. Now, of course, that wasn't always possible. And many XP projects were internal projects. So you, you could actually reach out and, and talk to a, a real customer easily. But, but it kind of points the, the direction. It points the direction to the fact that we can have many ideas about what to produce. But at the end of the day, it's not us who us who define if what we deliver is useful it's the customer and and therefore that feedback uh, loop is is incredibly important now you understand the feedback loop that i was talking about here is the feedback of you showing something to a non-friendly user and getting their feedback right sometimes that could be an internal user if you're doing internal software but very often that means an external user and that feedback is what defines value. And I think this is one of the things that we very often kind of miss in the discussion of what, of what value is, is that value can be assumed but never verified until you show real products to real people, right? Yeah. And, and that need 
the need to build the structures, the processes, the methods to get that feedback is Absolutely. really something we need to build in our teams. Absolutely. Um, I, um, I love to remind the product owners I coach that UX designers and people who are uh, skilled in user research and in shaping interviews, uh, that ethnographical, in ethnographical interviews are their best friends. Actually, the you can basically weaponize product ownership only if you have UX uh, and UX people besides you. Okay, so basically, you want to be if you don't have the direct skill to talk with the users, the first person, the first professional that a product owner should have besides them, next to them, is a UX user researcher, not a developer. That I understand that I'm sure most of our listeners already understand that uh, before even joining this session. So in your experience, one has to ask, of course, what's preventing most companies from taking such an obviously good practice into, into use? Oh, we have a long history of never using the word feel or feeling in anything we do. So everything I just described for you is how does Julie want to feel? That makes people's hair stand up, right? We don't talk about that at work. The other thing that we don't talk about is non-metric, non-numeric things. The number one problem that we experience in Agile is the desire for certainty and safety. So most of the things we do as a company, as a team, is centered around trying to get certain about how much this is going to cost and whether or not it will work. You and I have had the estimation discussion a million times. Having an estimation discussion like a business planning for a piece of software is like going to your mechanic and saying, how much is it going to cost? Well, I don't know. I got to plug the car into the computer and get it on the lift and see what's what. No, no, no. You're not putting it into the computer. You're not putting it up on a lift. You're going to tell me how much it's going to cost. I'm going to give you that money right now. Then you're going to go fix it. So how much is it? You can't talk to your mechanic. It's going to cost and what? Because your mechanic doesn't know what they don't know. Right. It's a trust relationship. So, so the, the first thing that happens is that we still finance projects the old way. Tell me how much it's going to cost to get how much result. And then I'll decide if I want to make the investment. But the future is not knowable. Yeah, Go look so at your... that, that's a very good point. Now you're talking about something that maybe we need to, to uh, approach and clarify where, and in how it relates to this value backlog, right? So you were talking about investment, which is, mm -hmm. in other words, investment is like, it's something we put at risk, right? Like it's like mm -hmm. investing in the stock market. That means you put the money there, but you don't know how much you get back, right? Yep. Uh, and and if, if we look at software development as an investment, then, then it starts to become more acceptable that there's a risk involved, right? Then you might not get everything that you hope for. And because there is a risk involved, you might be even willing to do experiments, right? Like instead of investing a million, let's invest 10,000, see what we can get out of there and uh, out of that. And if we can't get anything out of 10,000, maybe we try 20,000, uh, maybe 30 or 40 or even 50,000. But if after that you don't get anything, maybe that's a sign that you're not gonna get anything, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I. I, I want to highlight the fact that the way we finance projects detracts from us even wanting to know what value is, right? So we create some kind of an illusion like a, a, a business plan and we start acting as if the illusion is reality. The only way to validate that would be to get some feedback in, in small increment. But when we start noticing a fear rouge, I mean, there is a common pattern which is we try to use the recipe to somehow uh, to, to, to substitute the recipe with the taste with the recipe. So basically we're, we're trying to, to we, we start to believe that if we write the user story in a ternary structure, we will get value described properly. We start thinking that if we build a business, a business plan correctly with the right formulas on Excel, we will build a successful product. And we will start thinking that if you apply Agile correctly by the book, then our business and our enterprise and our uh, endeavor will be successful, which, I mean, I experienced on my own skin. It's not true, actually. I had a wonderfully, perfectly Agile made product back 15 years ago, and I crashed it because I was not 
business aware enough and that is the point that we mentioned at the beginning of this session actually i yeah. i really regret not having the the awareness of going to the market fast not just having uh, stand up meetings and i had a, a very wonderful test automated test suite and which was i mean a disclaimer i'm not saying a audience i'm not saying that we don't want automated tests i'm saying that they are not sufficient they are necessary to provide the quality that we need to pivot and look for the right value and actually that's the value in testing in automated tests is that, that we can pivot and and explore and try and experiment faster but the point is that if you if in the end you don't try an experiment it's no point in having so I think I think we're just coining a term here. So instead of doing test driven development only, maybe we should be doing test and value driven development. <laughs> exactly. We can get rid of the testing part and we say we have, we should be value driven development and, and so that's But enough. there's a very specific way in which we can do this, which is to deliver micro increments of value to the yeah. market, get feedback and move on and micro increments of value can be as simple as paper prototypes landing pages video demos like uh, uh, chrome did before it came live like everybody knew what chrome would look like because they did a video demo with like this comic uh dropbox did the same the way dropbox grew was because of how they uh, tested the value of the app by creating a mock video of what it would look like yeah i mean a brochure can be an MVP of a product. I think that that uh, needs to be written in the chat. Okay, I will write it in the chat. Let's go I, on. I think <laughs> that now we need to relate this idea of risk and investment to the idea you introduced with this keynote, which is this idea of value backlog. So how do you put those two together? Well, there will always be certain kinds of projects for which the investment is a little more predictable or certain. You know, thinking about the car example, putting snow tires on is pretty repetitive. We've done it before, so we know how much it will cost. So if your software initiative involves things like, um, you know, well, we got to do an Oracle upgrade. We know how much that's going to cost. There's no need for Agile because that waterfall process is predictable. It's tunable to an extent. But the minute we get into the unknown, you're dealing with stock market type investment. And the best way to look at it is to admit that we don't know what will delight our customers until we put something in their hands. And this is 20 year old, um, 20 year old doctrine from Scrum and Agile. The best way to find out what a customer wants and to minimize your risk is two things. Number one, show it to them, take a shot, take your best shot at understanding what they want and create something that you believe will be valuable for them based on what they tell you or what you know. The second thing is minimize the window of risk. How far will you go exactly before you decide this isn't what they wanted? We thought it was, and hey, we can measure what buttons they click. We can measure what pages they visit. Yeah, so stop, 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 stop. This, this is too, too important delighted. to miss. We can just ask them. Okay, so first, minimize the window risk is something that in extreme contrast, I call cows in small doses. We don't want to simplify reality we don't want to uh, make, create the illusion that the reality is not complex by simplifying it. So, for example, by saying, if you do this, then, or creating the ternary structure of a user story and what we mentioned before. But instead, we want to do everything that we can and that uh, even improvising as long as we keep the maximum amount of damage that we can sustain small enough not to die. So let me rephrase it for the audience. So basically what he's saying is, so by, by minimize the window of risk is uh, he's saying that we can afford to be wrong as long as we are shaping our process to discover that we are wrong frequently enough and cheap enough to survive that discovery. Yeah, and being wrong is cheap, then being wrong is okay. Being wrong is expensive, then being wrong is not okay. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that's, the, that's the part that we are missing of the failure rhetorics or the failure conversation. So basically, we want to fail fast as long as it's also cheap and, and we learn from that, from that failing. Otherwise, it becomes just a celebration. I mean, uh, okay, spoiler alert. We are all there 
to make our products and services and teams successful. So failure is a tool, not the goal. So there is a, this is a huge problem. And this is what, I mean, for the nerds out there, you should look for the Kelly criterion, which is basically the, the theory behind this reason. So basically you want to max, you want to minimize the investment that you do according to what you don't know. So uh, the point is that you want to, if you, Sometimes you see, you, you hear, okay, we don't know anything about this subject. We don't know anything about this market. So we should maximize our investment to know everything about that. And actually it's right the opposite. So the least you know, so sorry, the less you know, the less you want to invest. And once you get good clues, you can make that investment higher. And Which so then suggests we should have a totally different way to finance product projects exactly. we should finance them incrementally just like the software is to be delivered incrementally exactly we want to minimize the investment at the beginning and we want to maximize the investment once we are but once we use project manager project management as a framework we do the opposite we maximize the investment at the beginning which is when we know the least it's only possible when there are people who are managing money that is not theirs <laughs> the bureaucracy we were talking about <laughs> All right, let's go on. Did you like this? Would you buy this? How much would you pay for this? What about your friends? Would you tell your friends about this? So in order to work with a value backlog, we have to be willing to say we're not exactly sure what's valuable, even if they tell us. How many times has that happened? Customer says, I want this. We build it. They never use it. Yeah. So there's no way to remove the risk. But we have to see like any great balanced portfolio or an index stock fund we have to be able to look at it as a balance that there will be some failures, but we'll minimize the cost of those failures by keeping short iterative loops with tons of feedback and we'll be prepared to kill our darlings if they're not paying off. And of course, if we talk about value and impact, uh, you might actually get the conversation to go there, right? Like understand the impact of something, therefore also be able to define whether we want to keep it or drop it or invest more. Or, or not invest at all anymore in that particular area. Uh, so for me, what's interesting is how we, when you work with a customer or a client, like how do you bring up this idea of value backlogs? Because I'm, I'm sure that it has happened to you uh, and uh, it has happened to me as well. When, when you talk about value, many people roll their eyes and maybe they even call you idealist and so on so like how do you bring <laughs> that's the true, whole idea the of value backlogs instead of story backlogs to a relationship with a client team or organization i think everyone should have a story in their back pocket people love storytellers and a big a big part of what i do in the forge which is my the, the training program that i run is to teach people how to be influential because this is the big failure in agile we fail to convince business slash leadership slash executive, that there's value in this approach, that this works, but you have to subscribe to the concept. So my opinion is that you can't innovate without risk. It's impossible, right? So we can tell stories. We can talk about Elon Musk. We can talk about Facebook. We can talk about any of those tech companies that we know and love and adore. How did they approach innovation? What did they innovate? What did they do differently? And how much did it cost them to find that? How close did they come to shutting it down before they all of a sudden hit the aha moment, latched onto the thing that saved them and propelled them into legendary status? That's what heroes do. So at some point, you're going to have a conversation with someone who's funding Agile but doesn't understand it. When that happens, it's incumbent on you to hone your story. So that you have a way of saying, if you want to innovate, you have got to be comfortable with risk. If you don't want risk, if you don't believe in value, if you think we just build things because they're buildable, and if you think there's only one way to deliver solutions, then you probably don't want agile. You may not be ready for it. I don't think there's any shame in having that conversation. Do you? And by the way, that's uh, uh, one important aspect is that if there is no risk, there's very little value because the value is in the risk, is in you taking risk for someone else, replacing their own loss with your investment. And of course, therefore, then selling the product that, that, that you created, understanding that risk. Yeah, I want to protect this statement of yours from dumb comments. 
so the point is that the uh, actually we're not saying that risk defines value the point is that we're saying that uh if value lied in something that we know perfectly then it would be already there and there would be no chance to create new value so the the way you create new value is to create something that doesn't exist before and that implies risk so risk then becomes one of the signals of value so risk become one of the clues of value you to say agile may not be for you yet you can't just buy it like somebody buys a new shirt because they need a shirt it doesn't work that way you have to commit you have to be all in and if you can't do that or we're not aligned on those values i personally can't work with folks like that yeah so i think that's very important to accept right that we can't work with all the teams and all the companies in the world uh some companies are just not ready to take on some of the agile practices and of course to benefit from those uh, and i think you you opened up a question that is very important for us to ask like the the companies the product owners the teams we work with are they willing to take on risk and uh, th there's a, a couple of other talks uh, at the summit that explore this topic of anxiety right like how many how much anxiety are we able to sustain because risk means you're not sure right and and that uncertainty translates into the feeling of anxiety so how much are we willing to do and obviously that's one of the challenges of working with this value backlogs but what are some of the other challenges you've had when working with teams and and you know you got them through the first uh, bump okay i understand what value backlogs are now but then of course we start doing the day-to-day -day work and it, it's not always you know uh, uh, a smooth transition right from accepting that it's possible to actually making it work so what are some of the challenges that you've seen with the companies and teams you've worked with in adopting this idea of value backlogs easy answer backsliding so if we get everyone committed in rah 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 and we're doing this yes let's go the first time we encounter trouble or the first time you take your foot off the gas as a scrum master or coach there's the risk that people will start tending back towards their default behavior. That's human nature. You do what you're trained to do. And guess what they taught you in school? Don't take risks. Don't gamble. You need to save your money. You need to buy a house. You need to do this to be safe. Don't speak out in case somebody notices you. We don't want that. All through your school life and your work life and, and even from your parents. We've been taught not to take risks. Risk is a bad word. Failure is a bad word. I've done agile induction presentations for management. I have a slideshow. We used it for years. And it has a slide that says you have to learn to love failure. And at the end of the presentation, everyone's stoked up and pumped. And but they always come over to me and say, one thing though, can you take out that slide about failure? I say, why would I do that? And they say it's just not a popular word around here. So we've been cultured not to like failure, not to like risk. So you can get everyone amped up, but the minute they bump into trouble, the minute they face. For example, some. So <clears throat> it's interesting that he's focusing on the fact is on the fact that people feel anxiety anxiety when they are asked to start an endeavor the agile way, while rather to me, agile to me is meant to reduce anxiety. I feel less anxiety when I start in committing on a small capital for a brief amount of time and with a small team rather than embarking on an enterprise which has been planned on paper for the next 12 months with 20 people and relying on the fact on the illusion that we know everything that we will need to do so actually that gives me anxiety and, and actually at uh, the agile world that embrace this uncertainty makes me feel more relaxed. This is a key point. So actually I thank Chris for pointing this out because actually it made me realize that I should probably communicate this anxiety reduction to my customers because they are customers themselves, they are users and they, we, I mean, we said before that we want to care about how they feel. And so I should transmit, I should convey this feeling to my customers too. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I totally agree. 
Agile is a way to reduce your stress, not to feel stress. And it's, it does it in a very specific way, right? Like the, the whole concept of getting small increments delivered and uh, yeah, collecting okay. feedback so, early. It's a I very practical it. way to reduce anxiety. Yeah, actually, that, so if we're talking about following recipes and the illusion that recipes, recipes might work, Agile is not a, a valid recipe to build successful, it's not sufficient to build successful products and services because we need a holistic view of the business. But still, Agile is a very effective recipe to reduce anxiety. And that is the point. So probably one, of, uh, maybe I realized after almost 20 years that this is the key point of Agile. I mean, really. By the way, the 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 keynote I was referring to that speaks about anxiety is with Chris Moles. Uh, yeah. He's the complexity uh, person at the University of Hertfordshire. Uh, he's interviewed by Ari Pekka Scarp. So definitely check that out. Yeah, I will. Someone's looking at them and saying, who made this decision? Who decided that we could do this? Who put their name on the decision that will sink the boat? Nobody wants that. So they'd rather backslide into the comfortable way of doing things, which in large organizations is very easy to do, right? We join large organizations for the protection that they provide. So to come in and say, okay, everybody be risky. It's challenging. So what do you do to prevent them from backsliding? You have to teach people how to keep their eye on a goal that's emotionally compelling to them. When I start my podcast, every single episode, I say, let's take a minute to remember why we're here. And then I recite my little, my vision, my value statement. Every day I write down my personal vision statement, which is to say, I want to create massive art and experience that connects and ignites people to a life of distinction, simplicity, and strength to create heroes. I'm emotionally connected to that goal. If I can create heroes out of my fellow scrum masters and my fellow coaches and my fellow leaders, my fellow entrepreneurs, then I've done good in this world. And I can leave this place feeling like I've done my bit. If you can connect people to their goals, their ambitions, every single day, you have at least a shot of keeping them on track when things get difficult, when they don't know what to do, or they lose sight of the script. So we're, we're getting close to the end here. Uh, and uh, uh, I think it's important to kind of translate this into something very practical that our Scrum Masters can go out there and start doing, maybe even today already. Now, uh, obviously, uh, one of the things you already pointed to is, you know, have have a vision. OK, so. Uh, I might want to talk to my product owner about uh, why are we doing this? Why is it so important? But that might take a while. I mean, in my experience, even just setting up a vision workshop with the right people might take a few days, if not weeks. So what is one thing that Scrum Masters could start doing right away that helps to move their teams and their stakeholders towards value backlogs? Maybe it doesn't get them all the way there. That's okay because, you know, great things take time to achieve, but... What's one thing we could start doing today, Chris? I think it's those three questions and you can do it without a workshop and a formal team and a giant initiative. Go to your product owner, say, who is Stan? Who is Julie? Who's my customer? Who are we serving? How do we serve them? And why do we care? Give me your gut answer. I'm prepared to be wrong. I want you to prepare to be be wrong as well. If we need to have the workshops to vet it out, fine, let's have the workshops. But the reality is, Feeling is not a science. Feeling is feeling. Who's our customer? It's that person sitting in an office, overwhelmed with all the paperwork that they have to do, and all they want is that stupid checkbox. If we just had this checkbox, I could take hours off my day. I could give that time to my family, to my cats, to my love, whatever it happens to be. If you can get a product owner to make that statement for you, say, great, let's start there. If we can start there, we can continue to validate or invalidate it, to adjust it and change it. My vision statement changed every couple of weeks for a year or so, and then it never changed again. You reach a point where you realize this is me, this is us, this is who we are. So begin there. Remember the three big questions. What do you value? What do you want? Who do you serve? How do you serve them? And why does that matter? Second question, what does done and done well look like? And the third question, is only for emergencies, which is 
if the thing that I proposed to do as a team, this sprint, won't fit in this sprint, or I can't get answers, or I can't clear a blocker, how am I going to get through this? We don't quit. I mean, we don't give up. Again, this is the most important question. Ask the question based on. Again, as I told, as I told in the in the beginning, the, this third question is not just for emergencies. Actually, it's a baseline. It, the quality of our A plan is only measured by the quality of our B plan. The higher the quality of the B plan of the other options that we have to fulfill the need that we have decided to fulfill at the end of the iteration, the better our A plan will be. And the very moment the B plan becomes even better because it's cheaper, it's more effective or whatever, then we switch. So having more than one way to resolve the iteration should be a first priority for teams developing digital and uh, iteratively products at, uh, in, in, in iterations. And the key tip there is to define the iteration by the goal that we have rather Absolutely. than by an infinite list of stories that we wish we could do. Exactly. So, which is actually what is described in user story mapping, and that goes uh, brings us back to impact mapping. So, as we mentioned earlier, so this I think this is the 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 key takeaway for this keynote. So basically, or at least for this watch along. Okay. So <laughs> what we know about Stan or about Julie, and how they want to feel, what else might work? Chris, we're getting close to the end, uh, but of course, I'm sure that. Uh... Through this keynote, we opened many questions in our uh, viewers' minds. Absolutely. So if they want to dive deeper and understand these ideas further, maybe even translate them into something that they can start building into their coaching and, and facilitation, where could they go? What's one resource that you would advise us to check? There's a couple places, badassagile.com. Uh, check out my podcast, the Badass Agile Podcast. There's over 400 episodes there. If you just search for backlog, value, vision. I have a ton of episodes that cover this topic throughout the past four years. I also have a new online magazine called the agile horizon.com where we intend to talk about things that make people uncomfortable, the future of agility, what comes next, what happens if agile goes away, how do we continue to serve our customers and create even more market value? I can tell you as an entrepreneur, nothing matters more than the value you deliver and the people that define that. It's not me. It's not the developers. It's not my team. It's, it's the not the managers team. either. No. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to have you here as a keynote speaker in our summit. So thank you for your generosity with your time and your knowledge, Chris. I'm pleased. Thanks, everyone, for first of all, supporting Vasco and joining this conference. This is a wonderful place to be. Vasco, I've loved your voice for many years now, so I'm so thrilled to be on this show with you. Please come on the podcast soon so that our listeners can benefit from your wisdom and expertise as well. Absolutely. Always happy to help. Enjoy the conference, friends. Thanks for your time. Ciao, Chris. All right. That was it. That was the uh, keynote. Uh, I think the watch along is filled with insights and nuggets that are definitely going to take the conversation further. Um, I think that still a conversation that needs to progress is what is value? And uh, I think that this keynote helped us along, like the three questions that uh, that Chris shared and also some of the stuff we talked about uh, here on the, the watch along, but uh, definitely a conversation that we need to have. Uh, Tom Gilb started that a while back, a few years back, writing and, and speaking about it. But I still see a lot of the Agile community, a big part of the Agile community, more focused on having the right story format than understanding value and, and creating value. Too much, too much. So thank you, Vasco. It was fun. It was much fun. <laughs> All right, everybody. Stay safe. Enjoy the summer.